Lord, I ask that you would supernaturally help us to focus on you today, to think about your word, to think about ourselves, to think about how our year works out as we follow you, to think about the way you are guiding us and the things to which you are calling us and the people to whom you want us to be dedicated. Lord, we're excited about life with you in 2024. We're excited about life with one another. And we're excited about what you're doing with Woodlawn Church. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, you guys. I'm glad that you're here today. Uh, we are beginning a, t- a five-week series called Branching Out, in which uh, we get to explore uh, some of my favorite metaphors and some of the greatest teaching from Scripture. We're going to spend the next five weeks in Genesis chapters 2 and 3. So we will be in Genesis 2 and 3 for five consecutive weeks. We will cover it multiple times from different angles, from different, different perspectives, and we're going to see a lot of beautiful things come from God uh, as he speaks to us and guides us and helps us understand uh, what he's doing in the world and what he's always been doing in the world. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up to Genesis 2 and 3. Uh, if you've got your Bible app on your phone or your iPad or something like that, feel free to do that as well. Scripture will be on screen today, but I want to give you an opportunity to follow along right there where you read every day yourself uh, and where you take notes and that kind of thing. So feel free to do that. Uh, my name is Brad, and I think I know most everybody in the room. I'm so glad that you're with us today. Um, For the last year or so, we've been talking about these very specific things that are convictions for us as a church. And and I'm bringing them back up during this series uh, to try and help kind of remind and think about, remind us and think about what is changing about Woodlawn Church because there are a lot of things developing and growing. And I know that the change word, that's a word that typically people avoid and stay away from because we like to say things like, hey, uh, people don't like change. But I got to tell you, if you're going to walk with Jesus, you better love change because Jesus constantly and regularly changes us. And he does not mind upsetting my dislike for change in order for him to adjust who I am and what I'm doing and where I'm going and who I am. And so uh, this is for us a continual understanding of what God is doing uh, in us as a church. And so these eight different visuals uh, take place in the world's best backyard. If you can imagine the best barbecue you've ever gone to with your neighbors, your friends, your cousin, your family, whatever. And all of these things, these visuals kind of represent something about us as a church. Um, I'll give you a little heads up here, by the way. Uh, the reason why about three weeks ago or so we stalled some of the development in the new hallway out front was that we are waiting on these eight things to be designed. They're being cut out and designed by all of the students at Livingston Central High School's wood shop. And so that is them right now cutting out uh, the light. And eventually those will be stained and there's backdrops behind them. They will be decorating all of the hallway coming in and out. This picture was sent to me on Friday. So maybe in the next week or so, we'll, we'll be getting those back as a gift from those students. And then we're actually going to do something kind of fun, inviting those students to come here and see what they made for us and how we're using it as decorations. So eventually the goal is this, you will have a guest family, a new friend, somebody you've brought to church with you. And as you walk through that hallway to get from outside to here, you'll have the opportunity to have some of these conversations with the people that you brought with you to church, explaining to them about Woodlawn Church, who we are, what God's called us to do, and the way we're going to relate to one another and relate to God using these visuals, okay? So that's, that's ultimately why we're doing this. Let me throw some reminders out there. Let's jump, for instance, to the bag chair. How many of you own a bag chair? Who owns a bag chair? Some like, I will never own a bag chair. No, I, my, my dad, like he's got to have the good one, like with the table that folds out on the side and stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's like, it's like heavy duty and strong. The, the, the back chair, the, the idea is this, even though you're going to see in seven others of these, you're going to see this connection where we help each other, hold each other's hands, walk together with each other and things. At the end of the day, when we stand before God, you and I are responsible for ourselves. 
There's a sense in which you carry your own chair. So even when we need help, when we reach out for help, when God is giving us help from other people, it's because of the fact that he's growing us to a place and strengthening us to a place where we can make responsible choices and be responsible for ourselves. Everyone is Uh, responsible for their own chair. Uh, I like the swing, the swing under the beautiful tree. This is a place where we rest in the power and presence of God. We rest and enjoy life because of what he has done and is doing and will continue to do. If you jump up to the table on the top left, or sorry, top right for you guys, uh, that the table means we invite people to the conversation. We want you involved. We want you here. We care about what you're going through and what your story is and what you think. Uh, the grill, this one's easy to misunderstand. People are like, all right, the grill, that's where we go to eat. No, actually it's not. It's where you go to cook. It's where you go to serve. It's where you go to help. Uh, my favorite story about this, some of you have heard this one before. I invited a first-time guest to a previous church I pastored. He was a hunting buddy of mine. He was not very happy with churches at the time that I invited him to come and show up. It was a Sunday night get-together. All we were doing was burgers and hot dogs. But I tricked everybody. And I made sure that when everybody showed up, not a single burger had been cooked Not a single charcoal had been lit. Not a single table or chair had been placed. Everybody came, and I said, okay, guys, we're all throwing ourselves a barbecue. Let's do this. Who likes to... Who likes to put tables out? And a few guys would put tables out. And Who likes to do this? And a few ladies jumped in and did that. And then my buddy, the first-time guest who had never been to this church before ever, said, I love to grill. And so that night, that first-time guest walked to the grill and made hot dogs and hamburgers for everybody else in the church, and he had a blast doing it. You see, we come to the church to serve, to be involved in helping, to contribute to the greater good. That's the grill. The place set's pretty simple. We are multi-generational. Now, I'm saying something that's not quite true yet, Right? If you were to look around, you won't, you're not hearing babies crying yet. You're not hearing a lot of rustle and tussle from lots of little ones, but they're going to be. That is a change that God's making us, and it's a helpful thing. I love it when someone comes to me at the end of a service and says, I'm so sorry that my toddler made a little noise in the service today. I, I just, I, next week, I'll just make sure he's not here. And I'm like, no. No, I mean, maybe there are limits to what kind of noise we're talking about. But for the most part, the answer to that is always no. And I like to say, if I can't out-preach your two-year-old, then I need a new job. I need a new job. We want children and families and parents and grandparents and great-grandparents who together are walking with the Lord in a multi-generational church. The light is one of my favorite ones because the idea is this, is that the light to the, to the presence of God or the light to the gospel is well lit for anyone who's seeking it. We want to make sure that the pathway to walk with the Lord is well lit for anybody. We're not trying to confuse new, new people. We're not trying to make it hard for someone to figure out the gospel. We're trying to make sure that it's very clear, that it's very focused, and that we make that easy for them to see. The fire represents gathering close together when things get hot, when things get hard, when someone faces loss, when someone deals with trauma, that we gather around that fire with them so that no one faces the hot times, the hard times alone. And the last one is the fireworks, man. It's what we expect from God. We pray expecting fireworks. We don't pray expecting God to just maybe make something bearable. We pray expecting God to make something amazing, to to do something beautiful. That's who we are as a church, that we expect great things from God when we talk to him and look to him and follow him. So we'll, as we showed you earlier, we'll be lining the hallway with those same visuals this year, all as thinking through this idea of branching out. What does it mean for us as a church to branch out and do what God is calling us to do in the neighborhood and in this community and in McCracken County and in Western Kentucky as as a whole? You guys ready for that? Okay, so there's a visual I could have used that I didn't. So I'm going to just for one day, just for one day, just for today, I'm going to add a ninth, okay? And that would be these. 
I'm not a very good gardener. Uh, we, we, like, I stopped buying Stephanie and I things for Mother's Day and Father's Day and Arbor Day and birthdays and because we kill them. We're fairly, how many of you are like really like green thumbed? Like you're really like seriously good at this. Got a few green thumbs in the room. Hi, Stephanie, you got a green thumb? Man, I, that would be, you know, not my Stephanie. We, we are not green thumbed people. We are not. Um, I'm told as a non green thumbed person that not only do you need to plant and water and provide sunlight and have good soil for the, the thing that you're wanting to grow. But then at certain times of the year and in certain places and in certain ways, you actually have to clip away certain things in order to provide light for, space for, momentum for those things that you really do want, right? And so in our lives, in our individual walks with God, God prunes us. He does. I could read one of a lot of scriptures dealing with the fact that God comes into our life and removes or calls us to remove certain things from our life in order for the things he wants to be there to have space, to, to have a place to be able to do that. In other words, sometimes in order to see that which is great, we have to be willing to lose that which is good. That, that is a reality in our individual walks with God. It's also, indiv- it's also reality with us as church. The scripture says, as Jesus talks in Matthew 7, he says, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So we have to actually look at our fruit. We have to do that in our own individual walk with the Lord and as we grow and develop and strengthen ourselves as a community of faith, as a church. We have to be willing to look at our fruit. And in order to do that, we have to think about that which is good, that which is not good, what needs to be adjusted, what needs to be changed, so that we are a tree individually in your own lives, in your own families, in your own small groups, and in our own large group as a church. What kind of fruit are we bearing? And I have to just tell you, this is a hard conversation, right? This is a hard conversation. I'll take you back to one of the hardest ones for me. There was a season in time I was pastoring a church. It was growing very fast. We were seeing lots of people meet Jesus, lots of people be baptized, lots of stuff happening. And then I was in on a meeting where we were talking about some of those details, and it hit me that some of the fruit that we had been calling good was actually not good. And I can't, I can't tell you how hard of a punch in the gut it was to self-measure and realize that which I've been celebrating isn't as helpful as I thought it was. It came on a day when a, a young man had said, I, I need to be baptized because I've met the Lord. And something in my memory tweaked. You have to keep in mind, we had baptized in about a 10-year period nearly 1,000 people. So it was you know, lots, of, lots of memories there. Uh, it came to my mind that I thought I had already baptized him. Like, like I'm surprised that you... And when we looked into it, I realized, I can't remember if it was three or four, but we had already baptized him three times. And each of those times, woo, celebrate, great things happening. And then I began to realize, that's not good fruit. Because it's, there's something about how he's understanding the gospel. There's something about what's happening in his life that is pushing him to some sort of a, a false emotional feeling or experience in that moment that kind of makes the bad things go away. But then in a few weeks or months or years, it comes back and he's ready to get that again. So that's not, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. Now, I don't, this sermon is not about that particular topic, but just to say to you that sometimes when you have to look at the fruit from the tree that you're, that you're living or that you're leading and you go, wow, what I thought was so good is not so good. 
that stinks. I'm just going to tell you, it's no fun. It's, it's a total pain. It really was, hor- it was horrible for me to walk through, okay, wait, what are we doing that would lead to that? What are we doing that would aid in that? How did we not catch this? How did we not see this? How did we not handle this? Who's supposed to be discipling this young man? Who's supposed to be guiding him? Who has not been helping him? We've been baptizing. I'd like to put it this way. Is it felt to me for a moment like, like we were having babies born into the kingdom and then just punting them out in the parking lot, hoping they do well, you know? <laughs> when we were supposed to be walking with people and discipling them and hanging with them and and connecting them and mentoring them and spending time with them and helping them figure out what it was that God was doing in their life and how they needed to relate to those emotions and feelings and different choices and all that stuff that happened. It's, It's hard when you have to realize that what you thought was good fruit might be bad fruit. So I have to ask us, each of us in this room, how is your fruit how is your fruit, the, the fruit of your life, the things that are coming from your relationships, the things that are coming from your, uh, your interactions with people, the things that are coming from the way you worship the Lord, the way you connect others to the Lord, the, the way that you walk with him, what is your fruit? And maybe the bigger question might be, do, do you sense that you're flourishing? You see, sometimes as a Westerner, as an American, we read the story producing good fruit as if it's just about production. You know, like, let me make sure I get this one clear because this is important, okay? Is, is a, a good fruit means that you're making stuff happen, measurable stuff that's happening, and you can go to God and go, look what I did. I did good stuff, all this good fruit that came from my life. Well, Part of this visual is production, but part of this visual is not so much production as it is flourishing. You see, you love an orange tree because you get oranges from it. But even if you're not getting oranges from it, there's something wrong internally to an orange tree if there are no oranges. This is not just about production. It's also about health and, 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 and ultimately internal flourishing. Are you flourishing? And if you're not flourishing, you're like a whole lot of other people who have had to go, Lord, I'm not sure I'm flourishing right now. I'm not sure I'm flourishing. Lord, I, I, what do I do next? What, what is my step? Lord, how can you bring grace into my life to give me this next step toward flourishing? So sometimes our concern is that we believe what I'm going to call for today the myth of more. We just need more. If we, if we had more of that thing, whatever that is, if we had more, then we would be flourishing. If we had more of this or that or some other thing, that would mean that we're flourishing. And so we, we set out to try to find a way to get more. Think of it for a second. Is there anything in your life right now that you think, my life would be awesome if I had more of that, whatever that is? I got to tell you, I can think of several things. Like, I have no problem going, like, like, yeah, I would like more of this and more of this. More. There are three or four of them that really jump to the top of my mind. You know, that, that yeah, I, I would. And believe me, even in spite of the sermon being called the myth of more, I'm not telling you that we're supposed to walk away from more. That's not what I mean. We'll get into that further down in the message. But there is this myth, if we don't watch out, that internal spiritual flourishing will come from more. Let's personify the orange tree again. Okay, so you're an orange tree. You're not producing oranges. And then someone brings you a bushel of oranges and go, hey, here's some oranges. Okay, now you have oranges. So the people who needed oranges from you get oranges. But are you more healthy? No, you're still not producing oranges and you're an orange tree, right? So someone giving you more doesn't mean that you are flourishing internally the way that God wants us to do. So we're going to call that the myth of more, and we're going to spend some time looking into it as we look at Genesis, specifically chapters 2 and 3 today. So if you've got your Bibles open, I'm actually going to read from Genesis 1 for just a second, just the first little bit, and then we'll be right in Genesis 2. The very first words in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right, The heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created 
the heavens and the earth. I told you recently that any sharing of the gospel that separates uh, creation from what God's doing now is a mistake. It's, 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 it's limiting of what we do in our understanding of God. He starts as our creator. So jump over with me to chapter 2. Chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, is another way of telling the creation story. So Genesis 1, we have this most likely chronological step-by-step through the six days of creation. That's Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, it's as if the writer goes back and says, let me tell you the same story, but in a different way. It's kind of what's happening here. A lot less detail, a lot more interesting focus on some specific things. He says this, Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, God rested from all his work that he has done in creation. Now from that passage and a lot of others that go along with it, that's where we get the idea of there being a Sabbath day where we come together to worship the Lord, to rest in him, to celebrate him, those kinds of things. That's where that, that's where that comes from. Human beings have always been interested in God creating the world and in creating these things. In Genesis 2.4, the scripture says this, This is kind of the beginning of that second telling. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. He keeps saying it that way, right? The heavens and the earth. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made. Wait a second. This is poetry. When something changes or flips in poetry, it matters. That's the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So why does he say heaven and earth three times in a chapter and a half and then say earth and heaven instead of heaven and earth? Um, It's because the author here, Moses, is trying to help us make sure and recognize that we are now going to focus on the earth part. We're now going to focus on the earth part. And since that day that this is written, thousands of years ago, there is no doubt that humanity has been all interested in creation. Like the, we've, we've studied it. Scientists have tried to disprove it. Lots of different things dealing with it. In fact, just a little throw out for fun here to those my age and older. If you grew up in the 50s or 60s or like me, 70s or 80s, you even heard a really cool rock song that you thought was about the Garden of Eden. Some of you know this song. Robbie's laughing. Somebody in a God of Vita, right? You heard this song? Some of you are like, I have never heard that song in my life, Pastor. No, it's, it, it is, it's, it's a mispronunciation of In the Garden of Eden. That's, that's the rock song. And I remember being a teenager, singing along, had no idea the real lyrics. I was just singing In the Garden of Eden. That's what I thought it said. Uh, this is a 17-minute long song. In 1968, for those of you old enough to use vinyl, and now vinyl's coming back and kind of new and cool, it took up the entire side of the record, one song. The entire side of a large record, one song in Agata De Vida. It featured a, a, a very intentional mispronunciation of the Garden of Eden. Uh, but ultimately, this song apparently is a love story between Adam and Eve. Uh, and it also features a three-minute drum solo right in the middle of the song, back when rock and roll was rock and roll, right? Okay. That meant nothing. I just wanted you to really think about the Garden of Eden for just a second. Had no real purpose, but it took you back. Some of you are like, he is cool. Yeah. Genesis 2 verse 5 and following says this. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. So we're not in a garden yet, right? You're looking at my garden after I tried to make it a garden at this point, right? Right? No no field in the land, no small plant in the field, nothing sprung up, nothing's growing. That's my garden in May right there. That's, That's what I got. For the Lord God has not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust or from dirt. He formed him from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, 
And there he put the man whom he had formed. So God turns, in the story of creation, God turns an empty desert wasteland into the perfect garden for the purpose of human flourishing. God gives Adam this perfect place to flourish. From the very beginning, folks, I want you to get this, that God has always intended human flourishing to be a part of human creation. That that God has always intended for you and I to flourish where we are. And so not only in the New Testament does he say, hey, listen, uh, if your your tree's not producing fruit, then it's a sick tree. You need a a non-sick, healthy tree. He's not just concerned about the production of fruit. He's also concerned about the flourishing of the tree itself. Are you okay? How are you doing? What's going on in there? And as you find yourself flourishing internally, all of a sudden what we see is that flourishing internally leads to flourishing externally. It's not the other way around. I'm fairly confident that a lot of folks have dealt with these kinds of topics in their life, and even though they are internally not flourishing, they've worked really hard to try to come across as if externally they are flourishing, and we can fake that in such a way where we come across like we're flourishing on the outside, but we're not really flourishing internally. That's important for us to get. Okay, so I'm going to blow your mind with a couple of fun stuff here, just about Adam and the earth and stuff. So Adam, the first man, Adam, that's, that's his name. Not just the English pronunciation of his name. That is the Hebrew word, Adam. But the Hebrew word for dirt, ground, or dust, that which he was from was Adama. So Adam is made from Adama. God creates Adama, and from it God creates Adam. There is this gigantic connection between humanity and the ground, humanity and the earth, humanity and the dirt that we've got to catch. In fact, it goes beyond just the original connection. Think about this. Adam, man, was created from the earth. Adam, man, was created to inhabit the earth. And Adam, man, was called to subdue the earth. In all three of those things, there's this strong connection between Adam and Adama. Adam and Adama. This is really, really, really important for us to get. In fact, if I were to jump ahead a bit, when Adam sins, which we will get to later, God curses what? The earth. When Adam sins, God curses Adama. Because now it's Adam's job to take care of Adama, but that which he's now taking care of is not healthy. That which he's taking care of is, is now cursed. God curses the earth. Adam's sin brings corruption into the earth. That's, that's what's happening here. I'll throw it even further than that, just, just to give you another example. A few chapters from now, Adam and Eve have children, and many of you have heard the story of how one of their sons, Cain, kills the other son, Abel. One of the reasons that that kind of transpires is that they both bring an offering to God and God is happy with one offering and not happy with the other offering. The primary reason for that is the attitude behind the offering. That's the primary reason. What is Cain doing differently than Abel? But there's potentially more to it than that because Abel brings an offering of animals and Cain brings an offering from the cursed dirt. And then when Cain kills Abel, he buries him. And the visual in the story in Genesis is that Adama, the earth, swallows up Abel's innocent blood as if to conceal the crime. There's this visual in Hebrew poetry for us to catch and make sure we understand that there is this forever relationship between Adam and Adama, between you and I and the ground, whether it's literal, physical connection, but also metaphorical, which is why Jesus uses so many agricultural, tree, health, that kind of thing, uh, connections as he tries to describe what it's like to flourish as a Christ follower. Making sense? It's pretty interesting stuff, I think. Let's keep going. Genesis 2.8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, And there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, again, this is before sin. This is before the fall. This is before all of those things. Genesis 2, 9. 
And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 2, 9. Those trees, by the way, are going to pop back up at the end of the book of Revelation as we think about new heaven and new earth and what life's going to be like for eternity. For those of us who are with Christ, we will be in the presence once again of the tree of life. There are a lot of beautiful things about that that we'll get to in the future. This is a photograph of our front yard. Uh, it's back in the fall. It was a morning I was walking out to check the mail or something. Uh, and I brought this to you because I, I want to just talk to you about uh, how beautiful it is to get a chance to just walk in the park or to be in a yard or to spend time outdoors. Again, same visuals that we've been talking about for this whole thing as a church. We, the community of, of Woodlawn, we want to be the best backyard in Paducah. That's our, that's our goal. Um, when you stand outside and you see the beauty of the sunrise, you see the beauty of the trees, you, you feel the dirt and the grass under your feet, and you just spend time with God. The air is clean. The breath is nice. At this particular day, the, the, the temperature is brisk. It's just this moment. You see, being able to peacefully spend time outdoors, in the woods, in the, this has always been a sign of human flourishing. It's always been. It's not just the deer hunters, right, who, who love that feeling of the sunrise in the morning. It's, it, there are so many of us in so many ways who love the opportunity of being outdoors, outside, experiencing the kind of the, the reality of God's presence and human flourishing in us. The Garden of Eden. Did you know that in the times that, now not when this happened, but when the, 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 the early book of Genesis and stuff would have been read, people would have been reading this and writing this and memorizing this and that kind of thing. During that time in history, the only people on the planet who had gardens in their region of the planet were kings. They were the only ones who had gardens. So when, when, when people would hear that God, the king of the universe, the creator of the world, created a garden and gave it to Adam... And Adam and Eve had a garden that they got to live in. The visual for them is that God treated them like kings. He treated them like kings. He gave them everything that they could possibly need. In fact, the Hebrew word Eden is more readily translated in English as abundance. He gave them more than they could ever want or need. He gave them abundance. This is just beautiful stuff here. If I keep going in verse 10 and following, it says, A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. One of the two reasons why the church that I planted years ago was called Four Rivers uh, was that the Four Rivers of Eden. Also, there are four rivers right here in western Kentucky. So that's a, another really good, interesting twist in all of this. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hivala, where there is gold. And in verses 12 through 14, and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stones are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It's the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and ox, onyx stone are there. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the river Euphrates. This is one artist rendering of one of those rivers. Uh, the visual for this is to help us be reminded that fresh water is always a part of abundance. When we get to the end of the book of Revelation and we deal with what life in abundance with God is like, we are in the midst of the river of life, the freshest and greatest of water. These visuals for us are important that we get and that we know and that we recognize. God is bringing you fresh water. In fact, one of the ways in which we talk about the Holy Spirit living in us is this fresh water or fresh breeze from him, right? This is where abundance grows as you and I experience more and more time with these things with God. Let me keep reading. Verse 15 says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. The thing that uh, 
you should know about this story. Some of you probably have heard this before. If you haven't, uh, do you notice who God tells the command to? See, Eve's not in the story yet. Just Adam. So at this point in the story, God gives the command about what tree to stay away from to Adam. And although it's not written for us in the text, it will later be Adam's responsibility to tell Eve what God has said. A lot of folks like to blame Eve for moving forward on uh, the, the fruit by herself all on her own, but the Bible not only tells us that she's not the one who received the original command, we also know that while she did what she did, Adam was right there with her. Okay, so just say that to say not to take responsibility away from Adam in the process of this. He says, you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Right? Pay attention to what he says. You see, God provided Adam and Eve a wonderful life together with him in a garden that he named Abundance. That's what God did for Adam and Eve, and that's what God is still doing for people as we meet him and follow him and end up with him in eternity in the new heaven and new earth one day. (coughs) In comes the new character. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may not eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, But God said, you shall, I'm sorry, we may eat of any of the trees of the fruit of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And then Eve adds something that wasn't in the text. She adds, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now, we don't have any record of God ever saying that part. That's something that she kind of adds to the story. I share this with you because I want to remind you of something we say a lot here at Woodlawn Church, and that is that God creates and Satan counterfeits over and over and over. God creates something beautiful. Satan tries to take something that's similar to it, not quite it, in order to try and motivate us to choose that which is his versus that which is God's. God creates Satan counterfeits. You see, here's what's happening between the serpent and the woman, and we later learn Adam is there with her. It says, a seed of desires, or I'm sorry, a seed of desires sown. The serpent waters this desire with a lie. And then by her going, you know what? We're not even supposed to touch it. We're not even supposed to touch it. I would say legalism acts as a fertilizer, <laughs> you know? By creating new rules that weren't, that weren't rules that were there to begin with, now all of a sudden the desire to eat what you want to eat mixed with a blend of being told, well, that's not exactly what God said, mixed with additional rules that weren't there to begin with, All of these things together, and if you haven't experienced this in your own life, you're you're probably dissimilar to a lot of others because most of us have experienced that reality of a desire that's in you that's not good, blended with a lie about what God's word actually says, and then in some way connected to some sort of overstatement of legalism where you now have a bunch of extra rules that God did not add into the story to begin with. A seed of desire is sown, the serpent waters it with a lie, and then legalism acts as a fertilizer. This so often can be the reality of what happens. Genesis 3, 6. So the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. I want to make sure we're catching this. So the deceptive serpent intentionally misstates God's words. He casts doubt on God's motivation. And he paints a picture of a God who is in some way protecting his power and position from Adam and Eve. Let me restate state that again. So what's happening here is that the deceptive serpent misstates God's words. He casts doubt on God's motivation And he paints a picture of a God who is protecting his power and his position instead of protecting the human flourishing that he has brought to give to Adam and Eve. 
And it's from that perspective that a human being would believe, wait a second, this God who created me is hiding something from me. This God who created me is keeping something from me. This God who created me has something he won't tell me about. This God who's created me doesn't want me to know what he knows or doesn't want me to have the power that he has. If you spend time in the text of Scripture talking to us about the fall of Satan, you'll see that these are the same kind of lies Satan told himself. That there's more for me in this. There's more for me than what God is letting me have. There's more out there that's for me that the Lord has not, that not, he's been hiding from me. And so I want you to get this. Maybe the most important thing I'm going to say all day is this. Adam and Eve were not hungry for fruit, my friends. They were hungry for more. They were hungry for more. Is there something out there that God's keeping from me? That God's not letting me have? That if I do this thing that God told me not to do, but if I do it, then I'm going to get something that I'm not going to get if I don't do it, and I want it. I want the thing that I'm going to get by doing the thing that God told me not to do, and because I want more of whatever that is, I'm going to ignore what God has said and stop really believing and trusting that God put me in a place and gave me guidance so that I would flourish. The temptation is that we end up taking our own thoughts about flourishing and placing them over God's thoughts about flourishing so that instead of trusting him to allow us to flourish, we start seeking our own pathways to flourishing and finding that more that we want. See, when you hunger for more, the tendency will be that you will worship the provision instead of worshiping the provider. When you hunger for more, you will worship the provision instead of worshiping the provider. Here's what I mean. And this one's hard. When someone is sick, and we really want them to not be sick, there are at least two things that we're supposed to be seeking from God. One of them is the one that doesn't typically pop into mind for most people, and that is, I want to seek God so that I would know him so well, so that I would be drawn so close to him, so that I would feel his presence so powerfully, so that I will have his peace so fulfilled in my life that if and when I lose this person who is sick, I'm going to be at peace because I trust God. At the same time, we're told that we should pray for that person's healing. That this person, according to the will of God, if it be the will of God, get better, feel better, be healed. But oftentimes, and this is, this is the temptation, okay, Oftentimes, we want the second one so badly that if we don't get what we wanted in the second one, then we miss out on the first one. And it's not an either or. It's a both and. But let me tell you something. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, none of us reach 200. None of us reach probably 150. None of us reach probably 125. Most of us not going to reach 100. At the end of the day, loss happens. Human, temporal, here, loss happens. And when that happens, you and I have the opportunity, if we've been looking for both of those things as we walk with the Lord, to be so close to him, to know his peace so greatly, to experience his love so strongly, to live our life regardless of where your house is, right in the midst of an Eden-type relationship with him, that even when we experience loss, the peace and the power of God that passes all understanding is so strong within us that we still flourish. Am I making sense? 
If you don't watch out, you'll hunger for more so much that you'll worship the provision instead of the provider. And instead, we should worship the provider knowing that he brings the provision of human flourishing. Sometimes that looks differently than you want it to. But ultimately, knowing him and following him. You see, what if less really is more? What if, what if I need to find myself in a place where instead of saying, I need more, I want more. Can I have some more? I need more. What if, what if sometimes what we need to have is peace and hope right in the midst of where we already are? So two words I'll share kind of as we close out today. One is this. By pruning, cutting away the leaves, that kind of thing, one of the things that we do is that we give simplicity room to grow. We give simplicity room to grow in our lives. Here are a few quotes from some famous folks that you guys probably will enjoy. Uh, Thomas Merton, who, by the way, Thomas Merton was a Catholic monk in Kentucky, in Bardstown, Kentucky. He's pretty famous in that world. Uh, He was most likely murdered uh, for some of the things he said about faith. It was during the Vietnam War, uh, and and it's pretty interesting. So you want to have a fun little read? Uh, Thomas Merton, uh, that's an interesting story. Uh, He says, the hunger for more can become a haunting echo. Drowning out the symphony of satisfaction that simplicity sings. I really like that quote. I think it's a really good one. A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite theologians, says this. He says, be careful. Any possession can become an idol before God. We are warned. Do not possess a thing that you would hesitate to give another brother. Do not possess a thing that you would be hesitant under the right circumstances to give another brother. You see, simplicity is at least two things. Simplicity is it's not just about being simple. Simplicity is a mindset. In other words, regardless of what you have, recognizing I live in the king's garden. That's what he has for me. And even if it doesn't feel like I'm living in a king's garden today, then there is a king's garden waiting for me. Right? I don't know about you, but visualizing heaven has always been kind of hard for me. Because early on, all the visuals that I had were like... Uh, 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 almost like the cover of a Van Halen uh, where you got this baby sitting on a cloud, you know? Uh, that like, like, like as if we're all going to be like little cherubs, you know, bouncing around on the clouds and singing songs. Like, I got to be honest with you, like that doesn't sound that heavenly to me. Like, like, I, like I think that and go, okay, that's, that's hard for me to visualize myself with a ukulele you know, like just bouncing from cloud to cloud. It's kind of hard to do that. Um, but, but as we read what the scripture guides us to think about eternity with the Lord, one of the things that we see is this amazing garden with the tree of life where he says things like the leaves are for the good of the nations and, and from it all of our food and our nourishment is taken care of. And now all of a sudden I'm like, so I get to be outdoors in this flourishing, wonderful, earth-like or, or perfect earth experience. Yeah, even if it may not always feel like I live in the king's garden right now, knowing that that's what he has planned for me, that's what he has planned for you in eternity, wow, that's a great thing. Simplicity is not only a mindset, but it's also a posture. In other words, it's a way you set up your own opinions about everything. So when you've been promised the eternal, you can have peace in the temporal, Okay, things are not going my way right now. I'm not getting what I want. I'm, things are not, they don't, I don't know that I would measure that and call it flourishing. It doesn't seem to be what I thought flourishing would look like. But wait a second. I've been promised the eternal. And therefore, there can be peace in my life now in the temporal. This is important for us to get as we have this simplicity, mindset, and posture. The, the last thing for the day is that we also give contentment some time to grow or room to grow. Contentment. Like branches that grow wayward and wild, our unchecked desires lead us away from the one true source. So we prune them. We do our best to prune those things from our life. Richard Foster, one of my favorite top two or three writers ever, says, Christianity is the most materialistic of the world's religions. You're like, what? What? That's what he said. All material things are taken seriously as good things created by God for us to enjoy. Here's the reason I share that with you. Sometimes when people hear the word contentment, they think that means 
we're supposed to just be satisfied with nothing. <laughs> just be satisfied with nothing. That's not what biblical contentment is. Biblical, biblical contentment is not saying, I want nothing, I'll be around nothing, I have no desires for anything, so that I'm never disappointed. That's actually Buddhism that, that describes joy like that, okay? Biblical contentment is this. I'll, I'll say it this way. Um, true wealth isn't having everything you want. It's valuing everything you have. It's recognizing the blessings that God's brought into your life as he brings them and enjoying the things that you experience. That's contentment. A lack of contentment will cause you to overlook the things that you have in order to seek that which is more. And in the long run, you miss out on all the joy you could have had from the life that's been handed to you or that you've worked hard for or that you've developed. And in the process of doing so, you miss out on the joy God intended in your flourishing life because you're seeking more. Making sense? And again, I'm not saying that making a plan to do well financially or to grow your business, that's not what I mean by seeking more. But what I mean by seeking more is is pushing off your joy, hope, and contentment into the future so that you're not going to have joy, hope, and contentment until you get more. And if I could let, let you in on something, I'm going to tell you, my experience in counseling and caring for people and in my own failures has been more never comes. Like even if the more you thought you were looking for shows up, all of a sudden you recognize there's more. And then maybe... God blesses you with that and you get that and then guess what? There's more. If you push off your own flourishing until you attain more, then what you'll end up doing is constantly doing that so that at the end of the day, you may have lots, but you don't have you. Today's message is not about money or resources or whatever. It's, it's about life. And when I talk about more, it could be talking about more money, more cars, more houses, but it could also be talking about more friendships, more, uh, you know, more social media presence, more prowess, more popularity. There's lots of mores out there. That's funny. But uh, lots of mores out there. Um, true wealth is, is, whether we're talking about emotional, spiritual, physical, is not about having everything you want, but it's about valuing everything you have. And the way today to, to recognize the beginning of branching out is to say, Lord, what in my life do I need to prune? What does it need to be there? This could be sin where you go, you know what, Lord, you've been convicting me of that sin for a long time. It is time that I walk away and cut it off. Piece of advice there. If you will ask Jesus to do that in you, and submit yourself to his guidance instead of talking to him like he's the principal at your high school and you're making promises. Oh, Lord, I promise I'll never do that again. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. God, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yes, you are. The, the secret to dealing with sin in your life is to say, Lord, I'm messed up. I need your grace. I need your hope. I need your peace. Lord, please take this from me which will include him giving you boundaries and guidelines that you should then not step across. And so you get to play a big part in that, but it's not just you going, I'm going to throw all the willpower I've got into this and stop sinning. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. It's about the grace of God working in you to, for him to move these things out of your life and then to create boundaries in your life where you don't bring them back in. Okay? But what if the pruning is not sin? What if the pruning is just an emotion you've held on to or uh, maybe an area where you need to forgive somebody or maybe a goal that's just been in your life and you need to stop it? It's not what God wants for you. It's time to put that goal behind you. Get a new goal. Whatever that is, my encouragement to you today is to let the Lord guide you to prune the things from your life that need to be pruned so that you make room for all the things that God wants to bring to your life in a flourishing, wonderful way. That is how to begin a new year. I don't know if anybody in the room has made resolutions or not. I don't 
discourage or encourage that. Some people do, some people don't. That's up to you. But if you are the type person who's setting some new goals for you this year, let one of them be to prune the things out of your life that need to be pruned. And then ask God, what are those things? And then ask God to prune them from your life. And then pay attention to the boundaries that he gives you and stay within them. Can we do that? Let's pray together. Before we pray, I want to tell you, I I had our ushers take up our offering before the sermon today because I did not want anybody in the room to think that my message was to try and get a big offering. It has nothing to do with that, okay? So that's why we went ahead and did that ahead of time. So having said that, Lord Jesus, I ask that you would help us to prune that which needs to be pruned. And, and more so, Lord, than, than I don't want my words to put that on us, but Lord, we're asking you to do that in us. That you would prune that sin from us that so regularly holds us back. That you would prune that relationship from us that causes so much hurt and pain. That you would prune that emotional baggage, Lord. Prune that unforgiveness. Lord, prune that horrible experience from our past that we keep letting shape our future. Prune us, Lord, so that we might become become healthy trees producing healthy fruit. Jesus, I trust you with this. And I know you are good. And we know you are powerful. And we know we need you. And we trust you. You are the one who created for us the garden abundance and offered humanity its own flourishing. Lord, we want to flourish with you now. May we flourish with you now. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? We've had more and more activity in our room for prayer in the back of the room over the last few months. It's a wonderful thing. Our goal is this, just to give you an opportunity to not just kneel at an altar and have someone put their hand on your shoulder, but but to actually pray with somebody or even share with somebody what it is that you're praying about, to talk about. You can even seek biblical guidance help, counsel, those kinds of things. So in just a moment, we'll have one or two of our uh, altar counselors go to the back of the room. They'll stand on the other side of those doors. And if you're in the room while we sing the next two songs and you need to pray with somebody or you've got something you need to share, I encourage you to go to the back of the room. You'll get privacy and you'll have the opportunity to pray with somebody. It may also be though that you just want to spend some time with the Lord in a very focused way. And this altar area in the front is yours to come and kneel. and, And if you do that, We encourage it. We'll give you your peace. We'll leave you alone and we'll let you pray. Uh, It may be that you want to just stand right where you are or sit right where you are and celebrate the Lord and ask him to move in your life or even to just sing along with the song and worship him and celebrate all that he's done and all that he's doing. Let's do that. Let's worship him and respond to him. Let's sing.